All right. So now, let's try for the first time to be a little bit more quantitative. If I take two charges, and we use, in general, we use for charge the symbol Q. So here we have Q1, and here we have Q2. And let's say they are separated by a distance r. And the unit vector in the direction from 1 to 2, I call that r roof 1, 2. The roof stands for unit vector. If these charges are equal, both minus or both plus, then they will repel each other. And so here there is a force, F, which I call 1, 2. It is the force on 2 due to number 1. And since action equals minus reaction, force here is 2, 1, equal in magnitude, but 180 degrees in opposite direction. Coulomb, a French physicist, who did a lot of research on this in the 19th, 18th century, actually. Coulomb found the following relationship, that the force is proportional to the product of the two charges. So it's Q1 times Q2 times a constant, which nowadays we call Coulomb's constant, K, divided by the distance between these charges squared. And it is in the direction of the unit vector that goes from 1 to 2. This is the force on number 2 due to 1. And notice that this equation is sign sensitive. Because if Q1 and Q2 are both negative, the, source is in the, the force is in this direction. And if they're both positive, it's also in this direction, as I have it. However, if, the, if one is positive and one is negative, you get minus this direction, so this force flips over, and that one then obviously also flips over. In the SI units, in this course, we will use for the unit of charge the Coulomb, named after this great man. One Coulomb charge is a horrendous amount of charge, more than you will ever see in your lifetime. We normally work with micro Coulombs, sometimes even less than that. The charge of one proton, which is exactly the same as the charge of one electron, is approximately 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. So one Coulomb is something like 6 times 10 to the 18 protons or electrons if the charge is negative. This constant K in SI units is 9 times 10 to the 9th. And the unit you can find out because you know that this is Newton's, this is Coulomb squared, and this is square meters. So the unit is Newton square meters. Newton's square meters divided by square Coulombs. But that's not so important. No one ever thinks of it that way. For historical reasons, which may at times be a pain in the neck for you, we write for K one divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. There is nothing magic about that. It's just a historical reason. And so 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 is 9 times 10 to the 9th. That's all that matters. This epsilon 0 has a name. It's called the permittivity of free space. But you can forget about that. It's not important, the name. Notice that there is a clear parallel with gravity. Newton's law of gravity, that the force, which in that case is always attracting, gravity never repels, is the product of two masses. And then you have here 
the gravitational constant, and again you have the distance square. So there is an enormous parallel between the two. It's a great beauty that electricity acts in a way that is very parallel to the way that gravity works. If I added a third charge, for instance here, Q3, and if now I want to know what the force is on Q2, then I use the superposition principle, which we've used many times in 801, and we say, okay, the net force on number two is the force due to number one plus the force from number three. If number three, if this is positive and this is positive and this were negative, then this force would be in this direction. F1, F3, 2. And then the net force on number two would be the vectorial sum of these two. Is it obvious that the superposition principle works? Not at all. It's not at all obvious. Do we believe in it? Yes, we do. Why do we believe in it? Because it's consistent with all experiments that we have done. But the superposition principle, which is very powerful, is really not a matter of course. But it works. We can always use it, and we will. If you compare 801 with 802, thereby comparing electricity with gravity, you will see that electric forces are way more powerful than gravitational forces. And the way I can best show you that is by taking two protons, which are a distance d apart. Here is a proton, and here is a proton, and they are separated by a distance d. They repel each other, and the force by which they repel each other is, of course, extremely easy to calculate. We know Coulomb's law, that law is called after Coulomb, and so the force, the electric force with which they repel each other, this is just the magnitude now of the force, is the charge of the proton, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, but I have to square that. I have to multiply it by Coulomb's constant, which is 9 times 10 to the 9th, and I divide it by d squared. That's the electric force. If I want to know the gravitational force, which is the force with which they attract each other, these are repelling forces, but I just want magnitudes here, then I have to take the mass of the proton, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27. I have to square that. Remember, m1 times m2 times the gravitational constant, the gravitational constant in SI units is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11, and I divide that by d squared. If now I compare the electric force with the gravitational force, so I divide one by the other, notice that the d cancels. They both have d squared downstairs. And so you will easily be able to show that this ratio is roughly 10 to the 36. So the electric force is 36 orders of magnitude more potent than the gravitational attraction. 